Everyone loves a good zombie movie, or a good viral contagion movie, or really any movie with an apocalypse and a hero and a sepia filter. But it turns out that Hollywood doesn't always spend much time on proper science. Here are things movies get wrong about virus outbreaks. People slowly dying of a viral infection isn't very cinematic. Hollywood needs its thrillers to be kind of thrilling, so it isn't surprising they tend to jazz up how viruses typically work. In the 1995 film Outbreak, the fictional Mataba virus isn't just 100% fatal, it also has an incubation period measured in hours and kills its victims within a day. While it's true that some viruses can kill you in about a day, there's a delicate balance between speed and viability for a virus. In short, viruses that kill you super fast not only destroy their own host, they can't spread effectively either, so outbreaks tend to be pretty limited. Even the fastest viruses tend to have incubation periods ranging from several days to several years, and the illness part can last days, weeks, or months. And fatality rates for most pandemics aren't nearly as lethal as Hollywood likes them to be. The H1N1 flu, also called swine flu, was less than 0.1% fatal, while real-life Ebola is 40% fatal. That's pretty terrifying, but not terrifying enough for a Hollywood thriller. The movie 28 Days Later is a prime example of how Hollywood likes its viral outbreaks, fast and furious, with the world going from hunky-dory to burned-out shell in just under a month. This obsession with speed also goes for the process of infection. In 28 Days Later, victims go from exposure to full-on infected almost immediately, and even less fantastic films often depict people going from exposure to dead in a few days or hours. But the fact is, it takes about a full minute for your blood to circulate throughout the body, so even if we stipulate a virus could get in and immediately start hijacking your cells for its own purposes, it probably takes a minimum of a couple minutes to do so. And in reality, pandemics take a long time too, and so far not one has managed to actually destroy the world. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention notes that the 1918 flu pandemic took a year to play itself out, and the AIDS epidemic slow-burned for years. Even something like the Black Death took four years to eventually burn itself out. While it was devastating, it didn't end civilization. One inconvenient fact about virus outbreaks is the length of time it takes to develop a vaccine, so most films depict this happening unbelievably quickly. Many movies will have a vaccine developed in a few days or even hours. Even the film Contagion, which is largely praised for its scientific accuracy in depicting a fictional pandemic, shows scientists isolating the pathogen in less than two weeks and creating a viable vaccine for it in a few months. It's thrilling, and it seems like a reasonable time frame, but it isn't. In reality, the College of Physicians of Philadelphia reports that it can take up to 15 years to develop a vaccine, and even under emergency conditions, it can take a whole year. Creating a vaccine requires studying the pathogen, identifying the antigens that will help combat it in the body, then testing to ensure that what you come up with isn't worse than the pathogen you're trying to destroy. After that, you need to manufacture the vaccine in significant quantities and actually get it to the population. Hollywood prefers to hit the easy button on this process. This makes sense for dramatic purposes because you don't want the last hour of a movie to just be one long shot of people working in a lab. Movies often act like slapping a surgical mask on your face makes you invulnerable to viral threats. However, viruses tend to be tiny, and Dr. William Schaffner, an infectious disease specialist at Vanderbilt University, says the masks that can actually protect you make it incredibly hard to breathe. Regular surgical masks won't do for an airborne virus, but are often treated as nearly magical in their ability to ward off disease. Some movies do better depicting large-scale personal protective equipment, like full body suits with helmets that use positive air pressure to protect people. But even when they show scientists and doctors using such equipment, you'll likely see a million other mistakes, like walking from an infected room to another area without decontaminating or removing the helmet. Keep your helmet! Casey! Keep, keep his helmet on! Keep his helmet on! No! Don't expose himself, Casey! <coughs> In the movie Outbreak, Colonel Sam Daniels is confused when the Ebola-like Mataba virus seems to be infecting people who haven't had any contact with other infected people. It should be impossible because the virus is transmitted via physical contact and exchange of bodily fluids. Then he has one of those Hollywood genius moments. He notices all the ventilation ducts in the room and realizes the truth. Mataba is only spread through direct human contact. Now, you said that yourself, Sam. I know what I told you, but now I'm telling you we're facing a new strain. In other words, the virus has mutated. Viruses mutate all the time, that's how new forms of diseases keep cropping up and how viruses that usually affect animals can cross over to the human population. But what they don't do is start off being transmitted in one way and then suddenly go airborne via sneezing. In the film I Am Legend, the virus basically turns people into vampire zombies and leaves Dr. Robert Neville as the only man alive. 
Neville is somehow immune to the virus, and he uses his own blood to develop a cure. The only problem is that it doesn't make any sense. A genetic immunity like that can't be transmitted to others, and if Neville's immunity allowed him to produce antibodies that would make this possible, first he'd have to be infected so his body could produce those antibodies. If you watched Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, you might have noticed a familiar phrase when the virus is being explained, Patient Zero. A lab technician now known as Patient Zero. This phrase entered the general consciousness during the early years of the AIDS crisis, usually referring to one flight attendant who was incorrectly portrayed as wildly promiscuous and more or less responsible for the spread of the disease in the United States. However, the concept of a patient zero is completely misunderstood. In fact, the whole theory is wrong, as there were likely plenty of other HIV-infected people at the time, especially considering the lengthy incubation period of the disease. And as investigative journalist Dina Fine Marin points out, disease vectors are just too complex for a single person to be blamed. HIV probably arrived in the U.S. much earlier, possibly as early as 1971. In other words, while Patient Zero sounds appropriately ominous for a movie, it's trash science. In World War Z, Brad Pitt figures out that the infected will completely ignore people who have a fatal disease. There is some logic to this, as a virus's main goal in life is to replicate. A dying host would be a poor choice, and in nature, feigning death or infirmity to confuse predators is fairly common. However, viruses obviously aren't predators or capable of that kind of complex thought. But as biophysicist Scott Forth at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute points out, the other problem here is that the virus would need to imbue its host humans with superpowers. The virus needs the host human to smell disease on the dying person, and we humans just don't smell all that well. In Hollywood movies, there's no such thing as a boring death scene. When any character dies in a Hollywood epidemic, it's usually pretty exciting and kind of gruesome. The goal is drama, after all. When Gwyneth Paltrow's character kicks it in the film Contagion, for example, her horrified husband watches her twitch and writhe as medical professionals look on more or less helplessly. But most deaths from viruses like the flu stem from secondary factors, like bacteria getting into the lungs to cause pneumonia, or getting bacteria into the blood to cause sepsis, or because the virus exacerbates existing weaknesses like diabetes or asthma. That's why most deaths from any viral outbreak happen among the elderly and the already ill, not the young and healthy. In other words, most people pass quietly after lingering unconscious for a while, which isn't very cinematic, it's just tragic. Audiences like to see extraordinary people accomplishing extraordinary tasks, like a brilliant virologist who single-handedly figures out how to cure a deadly plague. A whole bunch of films about various terrifying viral outbreaks feature a single heroic scientist who more or less saves the day. Whether it's Dr. Neville and I Am Legend or Colonel Sam Daniels, M.D. and Outbreak, even the relatively grounded and realistic contagion features a single scientist developing a vaccine, which she tests on herself. Reality is messier and less dramatic, of course. Abigail Zugger, MD, Associate Clinical Professor of Medicine at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, describes modern medicine and especially public health efforts as a team sport. The idea of a single genius saving the day is fun, but almost totally inaccurate. The reality would be large teams of scientists working on these outbreaks, following some pretty rigid protocols when it came to testing, and no one person would be responsible for the solution. The movies always like to imagine that our government agencies and bureaucracies are incredibly well-funded, with access to cutting-edge technology and instantaneous data. Even when the whole world is collapsing in a movie like World War Z, Brad Pitt knows exactly where to go as he chases down clues. In movies like Contagion, the scientists are able to pop up sophisticated models of the virus's genome and show nifty videos where every single case of infection pops up on a world map, and computers offer instant, terrifying projections of just how fast the world will be consumed in a viral apocalypse. I power down the main screen and the workstations. Powering down main screen and workstations. Dr. David A. Ross, the president and CEO of the Task Force for Global Health, says the reality is a messy process where some info comes in on paper, the rest digitally. Most importantly, all of it comes in non-standard forms requiring sorting and manipulation. That means the likelihood of instant, easily understood computer graphics and reliable models showing precise spread patterns is very, very low. And that's assuming the data isn't coming from a secretive, paranoid, totalitarian country with an interest in fudging all the numbers. Maybe we don't need to point this out explicitly, but zombies resulting from some sort of virus are kind of unlikely. Movies sure do love the idea of a rage virus or a zombie virus that reanimates us or turns us into mindless killing machines, and audiences love that idea too. Films like 28 Days Later and World War Z play with the idea that zombies, which are clearly fiction, could become reality if the right pathogen mutated in the right way. But nope, it's pretty much all fiction. 
It's true that rabies, the most frightening of all viral threats, is theoretically capable of producing a rage virus-like pandemic, according to some virologists. But it would need to be a lot more contagious than it currently is to pose a global threat. Rabies can only spread through physical contact, usually a bite from an infected creature, and it has a very long incubation period of up to a year. A true zombie-like experience would require a lot more work to make happen. In his book The Zombie Autopsies, Dr. Stephen C. Schlossman imagined a scenario where scientists fuse a protein known as a prion to an airborne virus, resulting in a zombie disease. However, the big takeaway from Schlossman's book isn't that such a plague is possible, but that it would be incredibly unlikely to ever happen. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite things are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.